Hi, this is Mark Rabin. Welcome to episode 211 of the podcast for October 9th, 2014. Uh, today's episode is a little bit different. Normally, uh, my podcast is really all about my guests and letting them talk and highlight their books or their work or whatever they're involved in. Um, but today I'm actually republishing an episode of a podcast where I was a guest with, uh, with their permission. Um, I was a guest on episode 23 of a show called Healthcare Tech Talk, which is hosted by uh, Terry Baker and Kelly Hill. And I uh, wanted to share that with you here. Uh, it was recorded for an audience of healthcare IT and IS professionals, um, covering some of the basics of lean healthcare. And I hope this is interesting to you, or whether you work in healthcare IT or not, maybe you can share this with, with your colleagues or coworkers who work uh, in that area. So I hope you like this change of pace. Uh, I'll be back with more episodes with uh, my usual um, guests. So you can visit um, the website for uh, my podcast at leanpodcast.org, or you can go to healthcaretechtalk.net. I encourage you to subscribe to their podcast series. And uh, as always, thanks for listening. From the studios of Healthcare Tech Talk, it's your host, Terry Baker and Kelly Hill. Hello and welcome to this episode of Healthcare Tech Talk. I'm Terry Baker. And I'm Kelly Hill. At the beginning of our last episode, we mentioned that our Android app was out yes. and that our iPhone app would be coming soon. Yes. Well, it's there. The iPhone app for Healthcare Tech Talk, actually, it also works on the iPad, is available via the App Store. Yeah, I've already downloaded mine, actually. Me too, and already been playing with it. And I think uh, it'll be a real neat tool for our listeners to have a chance to engage with the show via the various buttons that allow you to give us feedback on email, call into the show, engage us with social media, or share with your friends. Excellent. I'm certainly glad we now have both available. Our episode today is Lean in Healthcare. This is something that we've both worked with over the years. And my feeling is, as I've talked to my healthcare technology friends around the country, sometimes we think that that's something that's happening to somebody else. That's happening to the clinicians out there in the, the clinical spaces. But really, with as important as technology has come to be throughout the uh, hospital or clinical setting, really, the healthcare technology professional, IT, HTM, we need to be involved in lean transformation. So we've got a great guest to help us talk about that today. Mark Graben is an internationally recognized expert in the field of lean healthcare as a consultant, author, keynote speaker, and blogger. Mark has worked in the automotive and PC industries as well as in industrial products, though since August 2005, he has worked exclusively in healthcare. He is the author of the book Lean Hospitals, Improving Quality, Patient Safety, and Employee Engagement, and co-author of the book Healthcare Kaizen, Engaging Frontline Staff in Sustainable Continuous Improvements. Both books have received the Shingo Research and Professional Publication Award. Mark is also the founder and lead blogger and podcaster at leanblog.org, was a senior fellow with the Lean Enterprise Institute, serving as chief engineer for healthcare activities, serves as board member on several lean and healthcare-related boards, and is a popular speaker at conferences and private healthcare meetings around the world. You can learn even more about Mark at his personal website, markgraben.com. So we'd like to welcome to the show, Mr. Mark Graben. Hello, Mark. Hi, thanks for having me on today. Mark, the reason I had invited you to the show today is that for about the last year, I have been involved in lean initiatives in my organization. And as we've gone through this, I have noticed that the message of lean has kind of been lost on some of my techie friends, whether it's in my own organization or, or really even as I look around the country and talk to, to friends in other organizations. So the goal today is of this episode is to get that message out to you know my technology cohorts. Mm -hmm. Can you help just give a, a quick introduction to what lean is? Well, sure. I, you know, I think at the highest level, we could describe lean not as a set of initiatives or projects or tools, even though that's often where people, practically speaking, get started. I, I think lean can be described, Toyota would describe it, as really a combination of uh, methods with a management system with an underlying set of philosophies. So that starts sounding uh, kind of heady, but 
you know, it's really an organizational culture. It's um, a, a way of thinking as much as it is a matter of um, what we do. And so, you know, by the reference to Toyota, lean healthcare is you know, an adaptation of lean manufacturing or lean production, which really has its origins uh, at Toyota or what they would call the Toyota production system and the Toyota way management system. And so right off the get go, and, and I'm sure we can delve into this, people would say, all right, or they would ask, they should be asking, what does something that has its roots in manufacturing and engineering and management possibly have to contribute to healthcare? I think it's the same way people in IT circles would rightfully ask that question, whether they're looking at methods like agile software development or the lean startup or, or related methods. You know, they're going to scratch their head and say, well, wait a minute, we don't build cars. But in practice and in, in reality, lean really has a lot to offer in terms of creating a better workplace, better quality, better safety, which is critically important uh, in healthcare. You know, better for the employees, better for the customers and patients, better for the organization as a whole. So I have a question regarding Lean. Lean often gets pinned to Six Sigma as well. Are these two separate entities or is this has this all become one culture? They are different but related. And and you know, there's there's different origins. You know, there's uh, there's some overlap where kind of, you know, earlier eras of quality management, you know, there was a uh, a lot of things were done under the label of TQM or total quality management. You know, in some ways, Six Sigma, which was really created, invented at, at Motorola and made famous by mm -hmm. GE, mm -hmm. you know, is, is you know an evolution of a lot of those um, statistical methods that people would have used in total quality management. Lean, in some ways, is also kind of uh, you know a parallel development to total quality management. There's there's a lot of overlap. When we look at overlap between Lean and Six Sigma, some of that overlap is concepts like continuous improvement. Using you know, Lean tends to use simple statistical methods that we would also see in Six Sigma. But you know, in the last five to ten years, there has been a trend not just in healthcare but in manufacturing and in government for people to label what they're doing as either "quote unquote" Lean Six Sigma or Lean Sigma. And I, I don't like to look at it that way. I tend to think of Lean and Six Sigma and that they can and often do coexist in an organization. I'm, I'm still not convinced that jamming it all together into a single title or a single methodology is really an accurate way of, of looking at it. You know, Lean was sort of added as a modifier to Six Sigma. Mm -hmm. So Six Sigma people uh, in a lot of ways sort of you know, evolve and say, okay, we're not, we're not going to call this Lean Six Sigma. We're going to incorporate Lean. What I guess, you know, the, the, the issue I have sometimes is that the Lean part of Lean Sigma is often incredibly superficial and limited. And I think it doesn't embrace the, the, the management mindsets of Lean, which are often very similar or very dissimilar, very different from some of the mindsets that seem to be baked in the Six Sigma. So you touched on an interesting point that I was curious about. How does an, a person, maybe a listener of, in our organization, even know whether or not their hospital or their, their organization is doing lean? Does it typically always come in under one name? I've heard the uh, lean transformation or just the term transformation. Have you heard in various uh, healthcare organizations a different kind of moniker that they might use as they bring this way of thinking and this process into their organization? Yeah. So, you know, I've, I've obviously embraced the word lean. I have leanblog.org. I have a book, Lean Hospitals. But at the same time, I, I completely recognize and understand and, and sometimes wring my hands or shake my head about the word lean. The everyday usage of that word usually does not have a lot of positive connotations. You know, people hear the word lean and even, you know, a dictionary definition of the word lean out of context of really what we're talking about here. The word means uh, having a lack of resources. And, and that's not at all what lean is about. Lean is about making sure that we have the right amount of, of resources. And, and I hate to call people resources, but, you know, it would include people, sure. budget, supplies, equipment, you know, that we have the right amount of what we need to do the job the right way. But, you know, sometimes the word lean gets in the way. People start thinking, oh, lean and mean. And, and, and that's not <laughs> meant uh, as, a, as a positive phrase. And so a lot of healthcare organizations, and, and I would you know, generally recommend or encourage this, they will brand what they're doing uh, in terms of an improvement methodology as something like 
operational excellence, process excellence, right. performance excellence, sure. process improvement, continuous process improvement. It's really kind of hard to argue with the idea of continuous process improvement. And under that banner, we can incorporate methods from Lean and from Six Sigma and other approaches. And maybe Lean, I, I think in my mind, Lean contributes more to, you know, kind of more of an overarching culture and management system. And we can certainly use Six Sigma methods to serve, to solve certain types of problems within the context of, of that. that. That's how I would view Lean and Six Sigma working together. Um, but yeah, that, that branding, I think, is important. We can orient people around um, what we're trying to accomplish as opposed to the branding of the word lean. I think that can um, often be really helpful. So Mark, uh, thank you for that. You started in healthcare in, in 2005. And I actually started in healthcare in 2005 as well and had these things called KPIs or key performance indicators. Mm -hmm. At what point, I guess my question is, historically speaking, at what point did, did lean really begin to take hold in the healthcare industry? And, and was it under other guises before we really adopted uh, the lean principles and put them to use? Well, it, it, yes and no. I mean, in, in some healthcare organizations, TQM uh, was, it was a bit of a fad. It came and it went. In some organizations, what they're now calling lean is very much an evolution of TQM, continuous process improvement, PDSA, which is an acronym that stands for Plan, Do, Study, Adjust. That's mm -hmm. one uh, you know, key mindset and key component of a broader lean approach. Uh, you know, I think the, the first specific you know, lean or Toyota-inspired efforts I've heard of, there's, there's a little, uh, I don't want to say controversy, uh, whether it started at some hospitals in Michigan uh, in the late 90s, or uh, there's there's a friend and, and colleague of mine, Joan Wellman, who had done some work with Seattle Children's Hospital in the late 90s. So, you know, there, there were a number of kind of very early innovators that were willing to make that leap to say, hey, you know, here are ideas from other industries that we think can be beneficial in healthcare. I think the main wave really kind of started um, in the mid 2000s. You know, when I started with Lean in Healthcare in 2005, you know, some of the organizations that we would today consider leaders in, in this whole area, ThetaCare from Wisconsin, uh, Virginia Mason Medical Center in Seattle, they started roughly about 2002. So they were still pretty early where, you know, it was a big leap of faith or kind of unproven concept of um, how this would apply in healthcare. As we got into the mid 2000s, you know, when I was out doing training or uh, doing speaking engagements or um, talking with executives, most of them had not heard of lean at that point. And so we were still really kind of trying to convince people, you know, based on some early evidence and some early examples, you know, that this wasn't theory, but there are good indicators that there are things we can do in healthcare to help improve performance. So back to your point about key performance indicators, I always try to emphasize that the point is not to quote unquote implement lean. I mean, I was, I'd be the first to step back and say, okay, well, who cares? Mm -hmm. You right. know, the key is those uh, performance indicators, uh, the things that matter, patient safety, quality, waiting times, uh, staff satisfaction, long-term financial performance of the organization, that those are the things that matter. And that's why we use lean or other methodologies. I think we need to keep the end in mind, if you will. Mark, while you mentioned there were those early adopters, and yes, you were in the uh, industry by 2005, has the Healthcare Reform Act really started to drive that need for this to become a broader adopted methodology or, or for organizations to really pursue lean transformation? Well, and I think it's a mixed bag. So what, what I see, and, and I'm by no means uh, an expert on the Affordable Care Act, but what, what I see and, and hear about from hospitals out there, sort of a split set of reactions. I think the organizations that were already embracing lean in a meaningful way embrace uh, some of the changes and reforms in the Affordable Care Act. They're embracing um, things like value-based purchasing that um, tie reimbursement uh, to quality outcomes and, and results and, and performance. And so organizations that were already using lean in significant ways to, to improve in those areas, I think welcome a lot of the changes from the Affordable Care Act. I think you know hospitals that can free up capacity um, to, to see uh, a higher volume of patients now that we have uh, more people, we, still not all, but more people 
um, with coverage. And so I think for a lot of organizations, they're really kind of continuing or maybe trying to accelerate their path forward with lean. I, I see another set of hospitals that um, are just kind of panicking and there's a knee jerk reaction where there was a lot of fear, especially coming into 2014 about reimbursement cuts and not knowing if potential volume increases were going to offset that. And we had a lot of hospitals going into what I'll call stupid cost cutting mode, which is the thing hospitals have always done you know, without <laughs> lean. You know, they, you know, and, and on one hand, you know, to be fair, look, you know, labor costs are you know, generally about 60 percent sure. of a hospital and health systems cost. But a, a lot of hospitals are just panicking and laying off people. And that certainly doesn't create any sort of environment where we can engage people in process improvement when there's a lot of fear. Uh, there's fear that, uh, you know, process improvement will lead uh, to, to layoffs. And I think that's where the lean mindset, and you've got this other set of hospitals that have been embracing lean and have, you know, for many years had some variations of a no layoffs due to lean policy. Those organizations are doing other things to reduce cost. And there's still a huge opportunity in different ways we can reduce cost without laying off people. We can improve quality. We can reduce harm to patients. We can in in increase capacity and see more patients. And so I think one, one of the things that's you know, frustrating to me is when, when people will hear about lean or what they think lean would be because of the word and they think, oh, great, this is going to this is going to be used to lay off people. But again, I, you know, I say and I don't mean this flippantly because layoffs are a, a serious and impactful thing is that hospitals know how to lay off people without lean. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Right. You know, if they want to continue down that path, they can do so. But let me, if I can I tell one quick story about a hospital CEO, please, in northern California, who uh, brought brought me in through the Lean Enterprise Institute right about it was two years ago this month to do some lean training for the executives and, and, and senior leaders and clinical leaders where I'll give the CEO credit. He had the self-reflection to realize, all right, in the last 10 years or so, that hospital system had gone through three cycles of kind of knee jerk layoffs in response to financial problems. And he said, well, you know, we didn't know what else to do. So we fired people and laid them off and we thought that was going to reduce costs. But then what happened because they didn't know how to do process improvement, you know, that creates new problems. And the gut reaction is to throw people at the problem. Mm -hmm. So he said we would lay off and then rehire and then we would lay off and rehire. And it really wasn't driving any cost reduction. And so he said, OK, well, that's not working. Let's try something different. And that new strategy uh, for that organization, thankfully, is lean. Awesome. Well, actually, I would like to springboard from that. The objective here, um, we have a lot of IT professionals that listen to the show. We have a lot of clinicians as well. We have health technology management professionals that are listening. And I really would like the opportunity to tie this to them a little sure. bit. We talked about lean in terms of transformation and culture change and, and all that. But you can actually, from what, I'm, from what I've discovered, is break this down very simply right? And tie it to frontline staff. What I'm suggesting is why does lean, why should lean matter to health IT professionals? Why should it matter to HDMs? And I think that when we talk in terms of um, the words Kaizen and Gemba walks come out um, mm -hmm. as sort of the, the building blocks, if you will, of lean transformation, that, that culture change. Can you talk a little bit about what frontline staff can do, I think that will connect to purpose for some of our IT and HTM mm -hmm. professionals. I was going to say, to add to that, from mm -hmm. my, my experience being part of value stream analysis and some rapid improvement events, mm -hmm. these, and we could mm -hmm. dive into those, I guess, but is that technology is so much a part of the frontline environment that if you don't have IT or healthcare technology management professionals engaged in these rapid improvement events or value stream analysis, you know, you're not going to have a re an important resource at the table is my feeling. Mm -hmm. What's your thought or experience on that? Well, so I mean, there's, I think a couple of different questions, a couple of different thoughts. One is that when organizations are doing, um, you know, rapid improvement events, which are you're typically a three to five day sort of, you know, structured team based uh, improvement initiative. It's really important to have a representative from IT to be in one of those teams. So even if we're doing a rapid improvement event related to operating rooms or, or to nursing uh, or in the pharmacy, um, technology, you're, you're right, is increasingly a part of people's lives. There can often be situations where that, that technology is, is creating uh, waste or challenges 
or problems for for people. And uh, you know, we need IT at the table, not to beat up on IT, but because IT can, in a lot of cases, help us, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, physical technology or, or software, to to try to get people what they need uh, to do their jobs the right way. But then I think it's also really important. For, for IT professionals, for anybody who considers themselves uh, a frontline staff member, to not just focus on, on big events, but to also try to think in a daily basis, you know, what problems am I seeing or running across? Uh, what opportunities for improvement am I seeing? And rather than pointing fingers at other departments or uh, just kind of complaining, to, to try to turn that into some sort of idea for how could we make things better and to focus on the smaller improvements that are within the realm of possibility for, for our department. Um, sometimes people call this quick and easy Kaizen. My, my co-author, Joe Schwartz, and his organization, um, the, the Franciscan St. Francis Health System in, in Indianapolis, they have IT people who have engaged in this practice of daily continuous improvement, identifying problems and, and fixing things, either individually or more likely within uh, you know, a small team within your, your department. So that practice is really simple, but what really helps facilitate that is the, the environment and the tone and the culture that's being established by managers. So I, I, I believe very strongly, and I think you know, evidence and, and experience proves this out, that, that people are generally very creative. They want to make things better. They want to do good work. They want to remove frustrations from their daily work. The barrier usually is not a lack of employee ideas. The barrier often uh, comes from that culture and that environment. Why do people get punished for pointing out a problem? Mm -hmm. You know, why do people get blamed for pointing out that problem? They had nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. but, hey, I'm trying to make things better. And, you know, there's, there's often a lot of reactions, either, um, you know, kind of overt or subtle that kind of just get people to just shut up and disengage. And so a lot of times we have to try to break that cycle and create an environment where people really can speak up and participate in improvement, whether it's day to day or, you know, part of uh, things like rapid improvement events. Uh, Mark, I actually much like Glean, I started my career actually in the manufacturing environment before I came to healthcare in about mm -hmm. 2003. So I remember why we brought technology into the manufacturing environment. We were trying to drive up quality and, and reduce waste and drive up efficiencies. And I don't know that we always think about using technology like that in our healthcare environment. And I think that that's a big part of what I think the healthcare technology professional, whether it's the health IT person or the health, you know, the biomedical type people have to think about the impact their technology has on that caregiver. I, mm -hmm. I've, I've heard people say, you know, why should I worry about doing that? Who cares if it takes that person two extra minutes each time they perform a task? Oh, but that adds up. <laughs> but that, and, and, and the ability, you know, not understanding how our technology we maintain, maintain, whether it's downtime or poor performance or availability impacts the clinician to be able to be efficient in their work, you know, that we need to be mindful of that. That's an important thing, a way for us to help the organization become more efficient. Well, and one of the reasons that I brought that up, and I'm glad that you capitalized on it, and now Mark has talked about it in terms of IT, is that IT inundation. Um, a lot of times that that clinicians in particular, I'm sure, as well as others, experience. And so I wanted to, you know, be able to emphasize that IT can get out there, can walk around, can look around, can have that um, the the same experience as the clinician, and then maybe, again to Mark's point, you know, come up with these you know these troubleshooting and identifying problems, and you know where to where is the workflow disrupted by what technologies are present. So that was kind of my hope. And so thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I mean, my my thoughts on that. Um, I mean, I think back even you know to my time in manufacturing, or if you think about other industries, why do companies embrace technology? It's to either I mean, a real fundamental level uh, for for the purposes of safety. Mm -hmm. If there is work at uh, at a factory that would be unsafe to be done by uh, by people, those are the first things that we want to have robots or automation doing. Mm -hmm. A lot of times automation can uh, improve quality. But it, it's it's funny. I mean, uh, I think, you know, a company like Toyota has a, a, a fairly specific mindset about technology. I think, you know, from early days of Lean, there's this, I think, mythology that, well, you know, Toyota's anti-technology. Well, well, no, but I think, you know, there's a lot of 
that's not true. There's a lot of cases where they use simple kind of, you know, visual methods that might seem a bit Luddite in their approach. But, you know, Toyota's philosophy is to use technology that's that's proven and well tested that supports their people and their process. So, again, things like safety or quality. But, you know, if you go to a Toyota plant, and I think this is still true, at least a few years ago, the reality was that Toyota plants tend to be slightly less automated than, say, a General Motors yeah. facility. Hmm. You see a lot of robotic welding and robotic painting, but there's times where there's certain welds or certain areas of the paint job that can be done better by a person. You know, mm -hmm. so there, there's, I think, in some settings, kind of just a over-reliance on technology. Technology will fix that for yeah. us. Mm -hmm. Technology and, for technology's sake. Yeah, or, you know, in the case of General Motors, and this is where, you know, I grew up and started my career, it was just this desire to get rid, to have as few human workers as possible. And a lot of that was driven by the awful relationship between GM and the UAW. So a lot of it was not rational or not good engineering, or it didn't make good business sense. So but now we look at healthcare. There are a lot of instances in healthcare where the technology is not helping productivity. We have automation that's making people's work more difficult. And let me just you know use an example not, not talking about software, but to think about other types of technology, pharmacy, automation equipment. I've seen hospitals that bragged about this fancy robot that would whiz around and, and pick up uh, packets of medication off the wall and drop them into yeah. bins and on the conveyor belt. Yeah. And you know, this, got, this costs a lot of money. It does. We've and, both uh, had this experience, yeah. Mark. And, and, and talking with the directors and, and asking questions and saying, well, how how much you know were, were you able to reduce headcount and by, you know, in my mind reducing headcount means redeploying people putting them into other jobs growing without adding more people yeah you know, I'm not talking about how many people did you lay off but right. there's got to be right. productivity benefit or quality benefit and the manager the director looked at me and was just starting to turn green because the answer to the question was well in fact well we had to add one person right. who sits there all day repackaging the medications yes. into those little single dose containers so well all right well hopefully has there been at least a quality improvement which would be admirable and there's oh well we don't know because right. you know the robot it scans barcodes. It can be really good about not grabbing the wrong medication. But if we don't have a good process that prevents the wrong medication from getting into the wrong package, the robot can't tell. You know, that's supposed to be a round white pill in that baggie, and this one is a round pink pill. The robot can't tell that. Right. You know, so uh, a lot of times, you know, there's there's cases in healthcare where, and then we've kind of over relied. So, oh, well, there's technology. Therefore, it must be error free. And that's that's not necessarily true. Well, and I I love this. The I love your point and the example. Um, for me, sort of the I don't know, call him the godfather of getting the the culture transformation out there. Masaki, am, am I? Am I mm -hmm. pronouncing that correct? Am I? Yep, yeah. Am I. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I've had the pleasure of meeting him and and yeah. reading a, a couple of his books, and he says just that. Um, it, it, frankly, in in those simple the terms, is you can't teach automation to differentiate and identify you give automation one thing to do and one thing only. And mm -hmm. yes, it will do it well and it will reduce the amount of error and increase quality for you. But that is the, that's the limit <laughs> of, you know, it, it doesn't expand any farther than that. Yeah. And, and in case in point, you know, a lot of hospitals are embracing, um, you know, robotic technology um, to go and, and pull carts and deliver supplies uh, to different units. And that's costly. You might reduce some labor, but I think of all the things a robot can't do. Like for one, people sometimes trip over these robots, even though they're supposed to have technology to prevent running into people. I've almost been backed over oh, wow. by these little uh, by these little robots. A robot going down the hallway can't smile at people. Right. They can't answer questions right. if somebody is lost. And so as much as people in healthcare, I think rightfully so, want to create a more caring, welcoming friendly human environment. Yes. And sometimes people have a misperception. They say, oh, well, lean and manufacturing and engineering and ah, don't don't dehumanize the healthcare workplace. And like, well, no, that's not what lean is about. Mm -hmm. You know, lean is about freeing up people's time so that it can be a more uh, a calm, welcoming, nurturing, caring environment. Um, robots pulling tuggers full of supplies down the hallway seem to be going in the complete wrong direction. And so, you know, the irony is that some people under the guise of lean will implement something like that. 
Well, why? Well, because it's more efficient. Lean says we should be more efficient. Well, no, lean doesn't say that at all. <laughs> That's somebody's decision. A, a person decided to implement those robots. I, I could make a case right. that we should be uh, embracing what people can and, and should be doing. And, you know, if the robot was being put in place because, well, those carts are too heavy and people were getting hurt, use lighter carts. I mean, yeah. there, you know, there are different solutions than just throwing technology at things. And, and I think sometimes people in healthcare fall in love with technology as the solution. That almost sounds like coming to a, a you know, they say when you go to a rapid improvement event, don't come with the solution in mind. Mm -hmm. right. Develop the solution as you go. And that sounds like, you know, like you said, people maybe go into these discussions. Are they really using the process to look at the issue in the right way mm -hmm. so that they get the right solution, not just the glitzy, fun sounding solution that, you know, they might have uh, walked into the door already <laughs> wanting, right? Right, right. So, Mark, uh, kind of getting back to helping our IT and healthcare technology management folks connect to their, uh, you know, what lean means to them. We've talked about how they can take part in frontline. This lean is not just something happening to the clinical spaces or happening to the clinicians. It is, it is a process that includes not only the frontline clinicians, the people who support them, supply mm -hmm. chain has a role in it, but it takes everybody to be a part of this process to make sure it's efficient, safe, high quality, and all the things that we want to bring to the table. What are some things you feel specifically healthcare technology people can take back to their operations to start thinking about lean? One of the things I hear is, or what I see and what I believe is that far too often we in the technology side gauge ourselves by the amount of equipment we take care of. I just interviewed mm -hmm. a guy yesterday and he immediately said, well, I take care of 200 servers and that was his badge of honor. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and I've, I've talked to people, well, we have an inventory of 70,000 medical equipment devices. There's a pride in or all that. Or they quantify oh. that. You know, we well, I yeah. oversee $3 million right. worth yeah. of yeah. And that they take pride in that mm -hmm. where truth is everything you own comes to own you. And there's an expense of owning all that thing. Instead, to me, what's the better badge is delivering the service with the right amount of equipment. <laughs> right. Well, and I think there's another. that's a great point. And, and I would maybe bring up a related, I think, core lean concept that a lot of times people wear as a badge of honor. Uh, how busy I am, <laughs> um, or uh, you know, and think. Well, okay, if you have two hundred servers that you're managing, you know, there, there's a fallacy um, out there about you know wanting people to be a hundred percent busy, whether it's uh, IT people or nurses or or doctors, when when or a server or if a CPU. I don't know if I'm making the right analogy, but if something is running at a hundred percent utilization, that means we're going to have incredible insanely long waiting times sure. to get anything done because you can't react because you're busy. And so one of the, I think the core lean concepts in healthcare that we focus on is not quote unquote efficiency, meaning, you know, a ratio of outputs over inputs, but we're thinking about effectiveness. We're thinking about flow. So we're not just measuring how many tickets did I get completed this month? We're measuring how long does it take to complete the tickets? How much waiting time is there? Um, how do we improve flow? Can we reduce batch sizes in the work that we're doing? Um, you know, and so one of the, I think, key principles within Lean is this idea that, that we focus on flow. And sometimes the way we have better flow is by reducing utilization rates of people. And that seems really counterintuitive because say, so, well, you know, uh, lower, lower efficiency, lower utilization means our labor costs are going to be higher. But yeah, what about all the other costs? Mm -hmm. You know, what's the cost of not being able to respond quickly to a problem? And, you know, uh, we think of hospital emergency department. Hopefully, thankfully, we're not expecting everyone in the emergency department to be 100% busy all of the time. Because then if that were true, nobody would be able to respond uh, to a trauma or a heart attack patient coming in. Very true. You need excess capacity to be able to react quickly. We don't expect the fire department to be 100% utilized in our community, <laughs> you know, but they find things to do in that time when they're not fighting fires that are constructive. They're, they spend far more time doing education in the community to try to help prevent fires. So thankfully, the fire department is not paid based on how many fires they're putting out. Mm -hmm. They're paid a salary. They're paid, I mean, you know, this is a cost of being a community, but they're given time to do things that aren't direct firefighting work. And I think the same thing would apply in, in IT or with nursing. If we're not 100% busy doing 
the direct work, what can we do to make good use of that other time? That could be working on improvement projects. That could be doing training and career development. That I think we have to get past the idea that uh, whether it's servers or people, that we're all going to be 100% busy all the time. That's not the way you optimize a system. And that's really what Lean is sort of trying to get it to focus on. Not, not optimizing pieces, but optimizing the system. Doing things, engaging in things actually to really prevent getting to 100% capacity, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. This has been something I've been sharing with my guys and, and thinking about. It's like, let's stop focusing on just measuring on task what tasks do I have? Or even thinking about task, task, task versus accomplishment, accomplishment, accomplishment. What are, service are we delivering to our customers? And that's how we measure ourselves. And that's where we get our pride from. Yeah. So that, that comes back to the lean concept of value. What is the value provided to the customer? And, you know, and people in, in quote unquote lean IT circles or lean startup think a lot about not just not focusing on the technology, but focusing on what problem you're solving for customers. What are you helping your customer help develop. So maybe one one thing I, I would, I'll throw out there as an idea, you know, in, in this lean startup methodology, they they talk about you know getting out of the office, go mm -hmm. and make sure you you observe and 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 be a bit of a um, if you will a workplace anthropologist or ethnographer and go and really understand the day in the life of your customer. I think internally, healthcare IT people can better understand the day in the life of their internal customers by going and shadowing a nurse for four hours, but not for 15 minutes. Do it for a half a day or for an entire sure. day. Do it for a 12 hour shift. You know, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think, you know, people will have a better appreciation for, for what people are doing, what their needs are. And, and, and I would encourage people go and observe, not to throw solutions out there, but when, if you're doing it at first, go to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The purpose is to learn, to relate, to empathize, to understand your customer needs, to build relationships, and then maybe move along the lines of what you can do uh, to help them better deliver value to the patients. I mean, IT is an important support function, and I think the focus needs to be on not, not what we're doing, but what we're helping other people accomplish. And it does take a mindful, I think, effort to go out there and get in that environment because so often the support folks, the IT people, even the healthcare technology management people are not, they're not in the clinical space. They are in a support building somewhere or yeah. certainly in the basement. Right. They are not out there. So they do have to take a mindful effort to go out there and everybody The only does. reason they go out there is to respond to an well, issue. Yeah. And, or... and the truth is in the IT world, mm -hmm. there are people whose job doesn't require them to, to move ever walk onto a health, mm -hmm. uh, onto a clinical mm -hmm. floor and they could benefit from it because of the reasons you just stated, Mark. I had people ask me, well, why are they always, you know, why are the IT people always off to, you know, in another building or something like that? I'm like, well, right. fundamentally, healthcare space is expensive. Hospital, you know, square footage is an expensive place to be. We're not going to put the IT department on the first floor of the main hospital <laughs> well, sure. or any floor of the hospital <laughs> other than the basement because right. it's just well, too important a space. And, and the same challenges appear when we talk about senior leadership team. You know, senior leaders in a lean organization view them selves as support staff. They're not the boss. Mm -hmm. They're there to support the people actually providing patient care, which I think is a, a healthy way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. And you're right. They, they're not going to be uh, right at um, right in that expensive uh, space, but we need to make it easy for them to get there and, and, and spend time at the Gemba. And you know, I just think of an example of a, a really good lean hospital where the one of the support departments, materials management, had a VP of materials management who came from high tech manufacturing and was helping them implement, you know, state of the art, world class materials management and supply chain systems, which include technology, included technology and better process, both hand in hand. And their mindset, and this was a guy coming from manufacturing, he stated it per beautifully. He said, our mission as the materials management department is to minimize the amount of time nurses and staff are dealing with materials management issues. Our job is to make their work easier and let them focus on being nurses. And so I think maybe that's, I would propose that's transferable to IT, that the mission of IT is to help minimize the amount of time people are having to deal with IT and, and allowing them to focus on uh, their, their direct patient care work. Perfectly stated. I know Kelly has another question, but I just want to dovetail on that. One of the things I tell my guys is 
every ticket is a failure. And they kind of look mm -hmm. at me, you know, what are you talking about? You're, that's kind of depressing. You know, you're saying every time someone Dramatic. calls in a ticket, it's <laughs> a failure, failure, but it's because we are taking time away from that clinician or whomever time to do their job because they're calling us. They're having to uh, put in a help desk ticket by calling us. They're having to wait for us to respond. They cannot do their job in a, as efficient manner. And so it's a failure. So I've really been focused on let's look at those tickets, maybe do a Pareto analysis, you know, take a look at the various type of tickets we get in, look for trends and mm -hmm. look for the, the – we shouldn't get calls about the same issue over and over. So let's let's take a look at that. Use that analysis and then focus on our, our uh, you know, low-hanging fruit in the places that we can uh, do the most good for our customer. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think one of the keys in reframing a quote-unquote failure is I think the healthy view of, of realizing, look, we're, we're human. Human error is going to occur. If we were to respond by firing everybody who did or could make a human error, we would be firing everybody. Yes. And uh, when an error occurs, to step back and look for the root cause, which is often something really systemic. If a server crashed, why did that server crash? And if it comes down to issues like, you know, a lack of training or somebody didn't understand something, and it's, and it's reasonable that that person wouldn't understand something, we need to, and sort of a, a, a you know, a, a blame, relatively blame-free, non-punitive way, understand why did that problem occur and what can we do to make sure it doesn't happen again? And, that, and that's a very different dynamic than asking who screwed up. We have to punish them. Right. Otherwise, oh, well, people, we're going to make errors all the time because they see we're not holding people accountable. Yeah. There's so many kind of loaded terms and I think kind of ugly mindsets that lead to things like people hiding and covering up problems. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Instead of bringing them to the surface where they can be solved. That's one of the key fundamental lean concepts is – don't hide problems, um, that problems are treasure, because those problems give us an opportunity to improve the system so that we minimize the risk of that same problem happening again. Sure. And um, that that's a very, very fundamental mindset. Do you feel like you know people are lazy or intentionally screwing up because they don't care, or are they good people in a bad system? We need to improve that system. And you know, if you know, if there if there was really um, truly somebody in the organization who was lazy or was careless, I would step back and say, well, why, why did you hire that person? That's a different type of system failure. Yeah. Sure. And it's just so comforting and tempting for executives and leaders to blame their employees instead of looking in the mirror, or looking at the system that they're uh, arguably more responsible for. Absolutely. Problems are treasure. I'm going to borrow that if you don't mind, Mark. I liked well, that a lot. I, I've borrowed that from the people I've learned from. So it's a, <laughs> kind of a common Toyotaism. The problems okay. are golden. Problems are treasure. Cool. Well, I, di I didn't actually have um, another question per se, but I, I kind of wanted to, you know, help us wrap this up by asking, you know, what what work do we have left to do? Uh, the future of lean and healthcare, if you want to, if you want to position it like that. But, but what, what do we have left to do to, you know, to really um, advance uh, lean in the healthcare system and, and how can we better embrace it and utilize it? There's still a lot of work to be done. Um, I always cringe and I roll my eyes, whether it's uh, related to manufacturing and healthcare and you know, somebody will write an article with a headline, eye-catching. It's like, okay, you know, well, what's beyond lean? Moving <laughs> beyond lean. I'm like, well, lean is is never done. We're right. continuously improving. And I think the there's still huge gaps in terms of, of, of leaders' understanding of lean principles. So we have a lot of organizations using lean tools and sometimes isolated lean tools. And they might not even be solving problems that matter. They might be saying, we need to implement this tool in these different departments, or we need to run X number of rapid improvement events this year. And again, I would kind of fall back on, uh, well, who, who cares? You know, are we really change? Are we really improving quality and safety? Are we really changing the culture? Are we embracing new ways of, of managing? And I think one of the, the, the biggest things we still need to accomplish is moving beyond a stage where leaders, um, quote unquote, uh, endorse lean or sponsor lean and get to a point where they are actively involved in lean. I think there's no accident that some of the, the leading examples out there in healthcare are organizations where the CEO 
realized um, that they needed to change their way of operating, that they needed to understand lean, that they needed to participate in rapid improvement events, that they had a really important role in helping change the culture. You know, that's not meant to be an excuse. If you're in an organization where your CEO and senior leaders don't have that level of um, personal participation lean, that's not meant to be an excuse to say, well, oh, well, it's hopeless, so let's not try. Uh, but I think for healthcare to really really get where it needs to be. Um, we're still trying to crack the code of trying to get senior leaders to directly participate. You know, the CEOs out there, like, you know, Dr. John Toussaint and uh, Dr. Gary Kaplan from, from ThetaCare and Virginia Mason, uh, respectively, or the current ThetaCare CEO, Dr. Dean Gruner. You know, when, it, when it's CEO to CEO, and, you know, I'm just some guy, you know, who am I? But for somebody who's been a hospital CEO to try to sort of wake up the, the other hospital CEOs to say, hey, you know, this isn't just about, this, is, this certainly isn't about fixing your employees. This is about creating a new culture. And, you know, that, that starts with, with us. That starts with, um, you know, the journey starts with you. If you're pointing one finger at everyone else, there's four fingers pointing back at you, um, however you want to state mm -hmm. it. I think that's still, you know, we're still trying to crack the code. Um, some of it might be generational, maybe the next generation of leaders that's been uh, exposed to lean and, and has learned this lean thinking approach, when they get promoted to the executive ranks, maybe that will drive a lot of that change. But I, I think that's, you know, I think, you know, I'm still focused um, on what we still need to accomplish. There's been a lot of great things that have happened with lean, um, but, you know, there's still, you know, there's still a long way to go. So, Mark, speaking of using technology in the world of lean, you were working with a company to develop an app that's uh, used for lean efforts? Yeah, and it's actually it's primarily a, a web app. The company is called Kinexus, K-A-I-N-E-X-U-S. And uh, it's a company that was founded. The original idea came from uh, an emergency room doctor, um, Greg Jacobson, who is our um, co-founding CEO. He's now our chief product officer. You know, he's, a, I think, a perfect example where the genesis of our software and the company came from, you know, some very specific pain points where Greg was working as, as a resident and then an attending physician and faculty member. I mean, he knows the day of the life of the customer because he was living the day of the day in the life of an ER doctor where there was a lot of waste, a lot of problems. They didn't have good methods for engaging people collecting ideas, following up on ideas. You know, they, they created uh, an internal web-based application at Vanderbilt. And like a lot of uh, university settings, they have a technology commercialization program. They say, well, this is not just something that would help Vanderbilt. This is something that would help other people in healthcare. So that's what led to the, the formal launch of Kinexus. So we currently have about 25 customers, uh, mostly in healthcare. We actually have a few customers in manufacturing and a few other settings. We have an architecture firm. That is a customer um, for our platform. And I think it just goes to show that the Kaizen and continuous improvement and lean principles uh, that our software helps support are, are pretty universal. It's not just for healthcare. It's not just for manufacturing. And so we have um, software that uh, helps people better coordinate their improvement activity and, uh, you know, kind of from, from beginning to end. And, and, it, and it creates a, a web-based repository where you've got this searchable database of all of the improvements that have happened in your organization, um, that's that's a pretty helpful and powerful thing as well. Well, that's neat that that's, uh, its genesis was in a healthcare environment and an ER, yeah. which uh, Kelly is, <laughs> is my an area. ER nurse <laughs> and, uh, and, and was shaking her head uh, uh, quite uh, vigorously as you were talking about the various uh, issues around ERs and why that app was developed. Now, people can learn about that at... The yeah, uh, www.kinexus.com. So, yeah, kinexus.com uh, is the website. Excellent. Well, Mark, um, you've done over 200 and, uh, let's say, I think 206 episodes of your own podcast. You've right. written mm -hmm. a couple books now about right. this. So uh, we're probably not going to be able to cover the entire uh, spectrum. Catalog. Of, uh, <laughs> of, yeah, uh, there's, I, like I said, there's an obnoxious number of ways uh, to be able to find me or contact me <laughs> online. So maybe I have a unique enough uh, last name. People can Google me uh, or they can um, go to markgraben.com, and then that has links uh, to, to my blog, to my books, to the different projects and things that I'm involved in. The blog is leanblog.com. 
org, and, and that's where the podcasts can be found as well. Yeah. And, and we'll be sure to put that on our show notes on our resources page as well. So. Yeah. Well, and your two books, you got Healthcare Kaizen and Healthcare and Lean Hospitals. Lean Hospitals. And, lean hospitals. and, and then and then we have a third book, and, and it's partly an attempt to try to reach the very senior people within healthcare. We have uh, a, a derivative book called The Executive Guide to Healthcare Kaizen, which is um, sort of a, a shorter, more to the point book that you know kind of eliminates some of the how-to detail and mm-hmm. the, the 200 examples that we have in the bigger book. Mm-hmm. And that was actually that was a, that was a lesson in voice of the customer, where people said, "Hey, you know, we want our executives to learn about this, but um, the healthcare kaizen book is four and a half pounds <laughs> because of the color printing and the thicker paper, and they don't need that much detail. Give us something that we can uh, that they can read on a plane." And, yeah. and so that's where the executive guide came from. Having said that, um, even though it's a big book, I, I think what's neat about the book, at least the Healthcare Kaizen book, is it's full of practical. It's not just theory. Yeah. It's a lot of practical examples of, of how you've implemented Kaizen in healthcare. Mm-hmm. That's almost exclusively what it is. So yeah. That, yeah. yeah. And, and we did that very intentionally sure. because uh, you know, it's not that people should copy the specific examples, but we try to have a, a little bit of something for everybody, mm-hmm. different departments, different roles. Small ideas, bigger ideas. Well, just different ways of looking at things, you know, is, is I mean, shown, it's demonstrated, and that and that gets people's brains going. Yeah, and that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you uh, again to, for joining us. Again, you have over 200 uh, episodes of your podcast, books, and so there's a lot of content out there and a lot of resources people can check out at markgraben.com. Yeah. Uh, hopefully our episode today will uh, has acted as a primer and a, uh, a way to get people started down that path. So thanks a lot for joining us, Mark. We really enjoyed having you. Okay. Well, thanks, Terrence. Thanks, Kelly. And thank you to our audience for joining us today on Healthcare Tech Talk. We wish to remind you that in addition to our Android app, our iPhone app is now available. So for the Android, please go to Google Play or Amazon. And for the iPhone app, you know to go to the App Store. For this episode of Healthcare Tech Talk, I'm Terry Baker. And I'm Kelly Hill.